Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. We're very excited to be here with you for our Ask Microsoft Anything on Microsoft Priva. Now, my name is Alma. I work on the Microsoft Priva product marketing team. And today we have a great panel of experts that are here to answer all your questions. So I'll go ahead and give them a quick chance to introduce themselves. Sounds good. I'm Amy Ding. I'm a product manager on the Microsoft Priva team with my colleagues here, primarily leading for Microsoft Priva subject rights requests. Hi, I'm Sanchita. I am product manager and uh, for privacy risk management module for the Microsoft Priva. Hi, my name is Min, and I'm a product manager uh, for Microsoft Priva, and the primary work on the you know privacy risk management as well. Wonderful. Thank you for doing those introductions. Now, one of the biggest concerns and questions we get when fulfilling requests, obviously, it's a huge hot topic, um, especially with changing privacy regulations. But one of the biggest uh, concerns we get is when having to collaborate on a request, oftentimes you might have to connect with another SME or connect with HR. And having a compliant and secure um, talk track is very difficult and you want to make sure that you're doing everything confidentially. So, um, Amy, do you mind telling us a little bit more about how Microsoft Priva helps customers with that? Absolutely. Um, so essentially with Microsoft Priva subject rights requests, um, it's built to be really collaborative. So you can add SMEs, let's say in this case, uh, Alma, as you mentioned, there's someone in HR, there's someone in finance, there's someone in legal, um, and you need their help with specific items that are in this request. So you can actually, when you create the request, um, you'll notice after it's done, there's a collaborators tab on that request. You can use that. You can add folks into that request and we'll handle all of that for you. So once they've been added, you would send them kind of that direct link to the request and they would be able to start collaborating with you. And we, we restrict their access. They can only access the request that you're directly added them to. Um, and during that whole flow, right, you'll be able to use things like data review tags. Um, there are more than 20 we give you out of the box with Priva SRR. Uh, you can customize the names for all of those in our, in our settings. Um, and I really recommend that you use those tags when reviewing content that you need to follow up with other folks that you're working with. You can also benefit from putting in file level notes, give them a little bit more context. Um, and that really lets you tell the HR SME, for example, what files specifically you need help with, uh, making it really easy for them to focus on that. And uh, finally, we also integrate with Teams. So by default, we will set up a Teams channel for you uh, with your SRR when you create that SRR. Um, you can change the default behavior in settings if you'd like, uh, but by that, you know, with that default behavior, a secure Teams channel dedicated to your request becomes available when you create the request. And when you add collaborators, as we mentioned before, to that request, we're going to handle automatically adding them to that associated team channel. So we do all of that for you. And that really allows you to chat and collaborate there. And when you're all done with the request, you close the request, we'll automatically handle the retention settings. We'll begin to process uh, to dispose that team channel and that content, similar to how we're handling you know, that retention for your request itself um, when you close that out. Um, so this really allows you to consolidate where you're having those conversations and discussions versus sending emails and chats external to that and potentially just further dispersing information about the data subject. Awesome. Thank you so much. Now, we've also heard how difficult it can be to foster a privacy centric mindset, um, especially when organizations um, have to produce resources and operationalize solutions to deliver to deliver more value. Um, what are some ways that Priva can help organizations modernize their approach uh, to delivering privacy value and also encouraging that awareness for privacy? 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, Elma, that's a great question, actually. So uh, this is something that all the customers have been asking about, right, as well. And uh, what Priva is built is basically to help transform from the admin centric approach to also empower the end users who are actually daily dealing daily with this uh, PII data, mm -hmm. right, on day to day basis. So the accountability, we don't want it just to arrive uh, live with admins. It is also with the end users and the main uh, concern I think the organizations have is that uh, in most of the organizations, there's a privacy training that happens, let's say just once a year. So the employees who are actually users who are actually using the personal data, they tend to sort of forget uh, what's 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 in the training, what's the right thing to do. So with Priva, you can, admin can actually configure the policies in a way that they can decide when to send the notifications to the uh, end users who are dealing with the personal data. Uh, for example, if there is a policy where uh, you don't want any of the personal data to be shared outside the organization and someone has done it, right? So in that case, uh, the policy can be, uh, uh, can be actually configured in a way that the notification is sent to the user, which uh, sends a training link within the mail, which is in the context of the external data sharing, right? It's not just a one blanket share training that comes there, right? And the mails are also actionable. There is a button within the mail which helps you do the right thing. So the, uh, I think is the thing I'm trying to say is the how Priva brings in awareness is by helping users uh, providing in context training and make it easier for them to do the right thing. Uh, Min, would you like to add something or? No, I think uh, essentially you cover most of them. Yeah. Great answers. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Now we do get um, a little bit of um, a little questions that sometimes like some of our other solutions, what are their capabilities? Um, are in contrast to our Microsoft Priva capabilities. And so we have Microsoft Priva in terms of comparing it to uh, data protection capabilities, such as like data loss prevention. Um, what would be some tips you can provide um, to our audience to give them a little bit of clarity between um, those differing capabilities? Yeah, great question. Uh, you know, I'm, I would take this question. And uh, I think there are a couple of things. Uh, I think I was using, you know, maybe using DOP and uh, I think the data loss prevention and Microsoft information protection as examples. Uh, I think comparing to, you know, what's Microsoft Priva. Uh, first of all, I think uh, when we're looking at the, the from the product perspective, uh, Priva essentially is a privacy management solution, uh, which is dedicated for managed, you know, privacy, uh, personal data information. And from DLP and the MIP, I think it's a, it's a managed by the data security team. For them, it's more focused on the, it, what all the sensitive information data uh, have in my organization. So I think from the uh, from the focus perspective, one side is to focus on the you know personal data. Another side is to focus on the sensitive information data. First of all, I think the DLP and uh, as well as the Priva, they can work side by side. They can work in together, right? Because I think you also can. You also can say, you know, personal data is part of the sensitivity information as well. Uh, but however, from the Priva perspective, the additional capability we are providing, one side is uh, from the visibility side, we're pro providing the single pane of glass. You can see, you can have a visibility into all the personal data you have in your organization. But I think from the MIP, DOP perspective, they focus on the sensitive information. So for privacy of, uh, you know, professionals, so this is a super kind of value for them be able to understand what all the privacy information in my organization. And then the second one is also from the risk perspective, DOP and the MIP, they provide the protection, uh, I think, for the personal data as well as the sensitive information data. But from the privacy perspective, we also not only trying to protect the data, we also provide additional risk. Uh, for example, we can uh, not, not try to just identify this data, block this, you know, sharing of this data like DOP does. But from the, I think, of privacy, we can identify, hey, if you have any kind of, you know, personal data in organization hasn't been used for a long time, you know, data holding risk uh, for personal data. And this is also can be additional capability within the, you know, privacy. And also like the data transfer, when you transfer data, not only transfer, you know, sharing the data, but I think a transfer data from one region to another region. I think this is a very specific to, you know, GDPR requirement. So these are the additional risks that can be captured, uh, you know, from managed from the, the privacy, uh, uh, you know, solution, Priva solution. 
Uh, I think that's uh, you know additional risk we can provide. Another side is also I think uh, you know we also provide end to end kind of a privacy you know issue management. Once you identify this risk, you can bring you know security folks, you can compliance folks, as well as privacy team, uh, you know into one single workspace like you know issues cases. So you can manage that particular you know privacy issue kind of end to end and provide a remediation to any kind of privacy risk. So these are the additional capability provide the you know comparing to you know DOP MIP. Uh, so another side is also you can see that for privacy is not about the managed risk. It's also there's so many you know privacy you know operations like you know data subject requests. Uh, you know I think this is also additional capability we're providing part of the pre you know offering. So I think this is a really kind of dedicated for you know privacy offering you know operate you know ops. Uh, I think for them to manage you know end to end you know uh, privacy you know needs, but nothing provide on the you know DOP solution. Wonderful. Thank yeah. you so much, Min. Um, now, we have gotten a few questions um, that sort of tee off of that request piece that you just mentioned, Min. Um, and when we're fulfilling requests on Microsoft Priva, we did get a few questions on what's the best way that customers can use Priva to filter data sets and then go through that whole review and annotation process um, that can be very time consuming. Yeah, Amy, do you want to take that? And uh, that's uh, you know very specific to the you know the SR. How you're gonna find, review and annotate you know this you know data subject request? Yeah, sounds good. I can take that one. So, um, in terms of review, right? You know, of course, there might be situations like uh, your data subject gives you more uh, information to let you kind of scope through. You've already run the request. Um, or just in general, maybe you want to take some common actions, right? So you want to be able to filter on things and then uh, maybe exclude things, include things, and so on. So I'll talk about filters uh, first. So essentially, we have recently expanded the amount of filters that are available. So you can use these within the data collected tab once you're um, you're ready for review. And you can essentially, you know, you know say I, I, you know, I want to filter off of, you know, certain participants or recipients or um, you know, certain time frames, things like that. We recently introduced a really powerful filter, a keyword filter. So now you can also leverage this. So maybe you want to say, hey, um, they told me it's about a divorce or it's about a birth certificate, right? It's something that's maybe a little bit more difficult uh, for you to find. So you can go ahead and actually use the keyword filter to sort of search through and bring that content to you in a focused review. So you can do that. Um, another thing that I'll call out here, just because we're talking through, like, how might I want to maybe annotate? So we have um, priority items to review, uh, which will essentially flag potentially confidential items because we see a sensitivity label on this item. Um, maybe there are other types of things, right, that you have in your review set, like uh, multi-person data, if you have defined custom data subjects for your org or, or even like retention on items. So it will flag these for you and give you that visibility. And you can essentially filter on that. And then you can kind of look through. And now you may find that I can exclude these. Maybe there's a, a you know um, an exemption I fall into that I can go ahead and exclude that. Or maybe you need to annotate part of it, right? You need to redact part of it. So maybe it has Min's info, Amy's info, Alma's info. Um, so essentially, in that case, we provide built-in tooling for this. So um, we support quite a few files. So let's say you're looking at a document, Excel, something like that. You can click on an annotate tab when you're reviewing the item in line, right? You're seeing kind of what that item looks like, able to preview it. And you can go ahead and actually uh, redact. So you, you'll we'll expose a tool for you there. Um, you'll be able to select it. Select, I want to, to redact. Do an area reduction and just essentially block it out. And what that means is you'll see that happen, you'll see it block out, and then you'll know that when I provide this to the data subject, it's gonna be provided in that format. Um, we essentially will convert that to a PDF to make sure that it, it retains exactly what you're looking at in the screen there. Um, so you can certainly uh, do that. And one last thing that I'll, I'll highlight here is a new feature that just got released for data subject highlighting. So, you know, again, we're bringing in content and depending on your search, maybe the data subject authored it, maybe they participated in the conversation. Um, but what about finding the data subjects mentioned in the item? This can be difficult to do when you've got long files or even short files, right, to be honest, when you're selecting them to review them. So one thing that I'll call out here is uh, when you go in the default view, when you select an item on that, 
on that plain text tab, you're going to now see visual highlights. So let's say you search for Amy Dang, Amy Hari at Microsoft.com, you put in my mobile number, things that were uniquely identifying me. Uh, we, we can see that, we know that, and we will highlight that for you within the item. So we'll go ahead and do that, and we'll even give you like visual indicators in the scroll bar. Um, so let's say it's a long document, you'll have these little orange boxes, you can just click on them, and it'll just jump you to the next mention of that data subject in the content. And that really lets you get that quick context, how are they being mentioned, does this apply to the scope of my request, and allows you to kind of determine relevancy from there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, now, we did get a great question. Um, is Priva available for GCC or GCC High? Um, who would like to take that one? Yeah, I can take this. Uh, I think, uh, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, so we made the you know, uh, Priva available into GCC and GCC High as, as a DOD. Uh, this is special cloud last November. Uh, so it is available for you, know, for you to use. And there's still uh, there's a few kind of uh, you know small issues with GCC GCC high I think a constraints there, and we're working through that. And I think there was one example is the uh, I think the sending kind of a digest email notifications to the end user. So this is still being working through, but I think it will be available in the you know upcoming you know, months. I think uh, we're we're close to you know to make that available. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Now we did get a great question. Um, from a privacy perspective, a lot of our customers have PII um, in Microsoft 365, right? That unstructured data, but there are also other platforms and other systems where data lives. Um, does subject rights requests um, in Priva also span or have some flex flexibility to other non-Microsoft 365 data? Amy, can you help us with that one? Absolutely. Uh, so for that, um, the the longer answer I would say is actually, in a way, right, we do. Um, and this is through the import file feature. So I think here, um, essentially what happens is you're gonna run that request. You can run that request through the solution. You can actually also kick off that request through an API if you have a line of business app or something like that. So here I'm just thinking about um, kind of that question um, where they're saying, you know, we don't have a lot of content in Microsoft 365. So maybe you're you're wanting to kick off the request externally from going into the UI and do that, um, or or through the UI itself. So once you get in there, um, there will be a, essentially in the upper right of the request, you'll see an import file option. You can actually select that, and let's say you have content outside of Microsoft 365, you can import it into the request. And the great benefit there is you will be able to use our inline review tools. Um, so again, you'll be able to review it. You'll be able to uh, you know, annotate it, redact it, and so on, and, and incorporate it into the data subject package. We won't run a search against it. So just kind of calling that out today, we don't run a search against non-Microsoft 365 um, content, but we do accommodate for you to bring it into an existing request that you create. Awesome, thank you so much. Now, um, we did get another question. Um, it sounds like there is overlap between Priva and Purview, and I think we're all very familiar with that, Purview and Priva, and I, there's a lot of uh, common ground there, but um, is there a resource that can compare and contrast those uh, capabilities so we can focus on which uh, solution might be good for them? Maybe it's a combination. Yeah, I think Min is the right person to answer this one. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh... I remember, I think, you know, we do have some of the resource, uh, I think, when we're comparing, you know, uh, Priva, I think, because Priva come out with the add-on, you know, license, and then, you know, also, I think, a purview was come from the, you know, the E5 license. And I think, Amy, I remember we have some of the resource, you know, document to do that, you know, comparison, I think, back in, I think, probably, I think, last, you know, kind of November time. And maybe we can, we can share this uh, as, a, as one of the follow-up for this one. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. And I think in addition to that, right, um, some things that maybe we can even highlight now, right, is I think we've heard things about, you know, is there overlap with maybe some protective uh, pieces you might be running, like whether that be DLP in purview or something else, is there overlap with um, e-discovery, right, in, in, in purview. And I think for a lot of that, again, we'll see, you know, maybe there's a, a resource we publish we can kind of 
point to for that. But just from the Priva perspective, I think one thing to call out that Alma, I think would be great to get your perspective on as well is that in Priva, we are focused on doing things a little bit differently as well, right? So in Priva, for example, not only are you highlighting risks that are actually more focused on privacy, right, with personal data, um, you know, in the context of how your users are dealing with that data, how they're sharing that, how they're being productive with it, how they're collaborating with it. We're taking that approach of, you know, you need to be productive, you need to be able to collaborate, but you need to change behaviors effectively, right? Which was, I think, a little bit of what Sanchita talked about before with, you know, empowering those end users working with the data to know, hey, just in time, give them feedback. Hey, it looks like you're sharing this, this content with everybody in the org. Did you even do that? Because you have XYZ personal data in there. And it's done in a seamless kind of non-obtrusive way through the, the solution, right? So you're able to kind of interact with them, let them know what's happening, give them training that's targeted to what we're seeing that they're doing and just kind of really affect that positive privacy culture change in the organization. That I think is one, one thing we can point out. The other, of course, being, um, you know, we're treating data in a different way, like we're focusing on those privacy risks. And even with SRR, right, it was built to be collaborative and it was built to really service the data subject rights request process itself. So I think here, um, you know, hopefully we augment, right? More, more than anything, I think what we're trying to say is we do augment um, all of the solution space that we have, but there are different priorities your privacy team might have or you as an organization might have. And so it's really good to be aware of what we're doing in Priva that can really highlight that value for you um, versus, you know, just focusing on, is this an overlap? I think it's good to say, well, there might be certain overlaps depending on how you're looking at things like classifications, for example, but it's pivoted in a way that we really drive focus on privacy. So that itself is, is a different value. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that is sort of, I, I think Microsoft Priva is, has all this great capabilities, but that end user experience, um, that's the focus that will drive those long-term behaviors to create a better environment for your for your teams, for your admins, everyone involved. Um, now, Microsoft Priva, as we all know, has um, that focus on privacy, but when you get these great insights as an end user like myself, and it's in your flow of work, I think that's when you sort of see um, like actual action. I can take action right within my Outlook, um, I can see the insights come into teams. And I feel like that is what will sort of differentiate um, just learning about it in passing and actually absorbing it and putting it into practice. Um, so yeah, very, very good. Um, now we did, did get another question. Um, is there a way to monitor personal data transfers outside of a company, uh, for instance, with a close partner? Yeah, I got this one. So uh, Elma, as you know, right, uh, for Priva, uh, for the people out there. So the Priva, this actually, there are different kind of policies that you can configure that can meet the def uh, unique needs of your organization. By default, we give you three policies. One is the data transfer that I think the case that's being talked about here, where uh, any data that is being transferred, any personal data that is being moved outside the organization mm -hmm. that can be detected and the insights are shown to the admin. And uh, uh, if the uh, and user notification is configured in the policy. If you can go and edit and just change the configuration for the notification and even the person who has initiated the data transfer outside the organization, they can also get the mail around it. So that's the first policy. Just I'll touch base upon the couple of other policies out of the box that we provide that is for the data overexposure and uh, the data minimization, which sort of lets you know what is the unused data that's uh, sitting in your tenant for the last 30 days. So these are the policies that you get. Okay, awesome. And and actually follow up with that. Um, what are so those are the templates that come with the product. Uh, what are some of the ways that you can customize those policies um, so it caters to those individuals? Right. 
So I, I'll, yeah, so there are multiple conditions that you can set within the policy. Uh, I'll take the example of data transfer, for example. So by default, we give you the external transfer that is when the data is moving outside the organization. But you can uh, check whether the data, you can basically detect whether the data is being transferred within the departments, between regions, if our data is leaving the boundary of, uh, say, European region and going outside to any Asia region, those kind of uh, conditions. Uh, you can track the data detect that sorry detect the data transfer between sharepoint sites m365 groups uh, so there are multiple conditions uh, which come so i uh, like you can go and uh, and explore the product a bit and then you can see the other options well yeah i'm gonna add uh, you know a few things here absolutely yeah so i think uh, as essentially i mentioned that you know for example data transfer policy can monitor any personal data being shared you know outside your organizations and we're not only trying to detect, you know, what's happening, uh, you know, uh, happening going on, and we're also sending the digest email to the end user who initiated this, you know, transfer. Another side is we also bring all this, you know, detected information back to the admin. Admin also can have a, you know, dashboard. They can monitor all the policy matches, and uh, from there they can see, you know, where the people, uh, who are the people sending the data, and where this data being, you know, shared to all, all the organizations. Uh, part of the question you're asking uh, is, so for example, with a close partner, for example, if I'm sharing the data to, uh, you know, company ABC, so I mm -hmm. should be able to go into the policy match to see, you know, what are there any data being sent to the, you know, ABC, you know, extender. So you can, from there, you can filter in, uh, you know, the destinations. And uh, I think we are, I think that's, that's the, you know, the additional capability being provided there. And uh, I, I just want to kind of add that points. Yeah. Thank yeah, you thanks, so much. Ben. Yeah. Now we did get um, a great question. So when a policy is set in place um, and an end users do something that introduces risk, um, how how does Priva notify them? Like how specifically does that take place? Yeah. So uh Basically, the email is sent is a digest email option at the time of uh, configuring the policies the admin can select uh, the digest email option. When they turn that option on, there are multiple configurations that they can set within the option. They can uh, edit the email, they can change the subject, uh, the body of the mail, the training links that they want to give. That's one change that they can make. They can set the frequency, whether they want the a mail to go on a daily, weekly, or a monthly frequency to the end user. And uh, at once they configure these options and they create a policy, then the policy just kicks in. And if a user, for example, if I am a user and I have uh, overshared a document and the policy mm -hmm. on my ten IT has admin has set it right, so I will receive an email at the frequency of the setting. So if the frequency is weekly, so the next week that I get every week, I will get a mail for the data violations or the external data that I have shared outside my example for organization for in the last one week, right? So uh, that's that's how it sort of works. And uh, I guess that's uh, that's the notification is basically up from the email. Uh, Min, yeah. would you like to add something? Yeah, I add a few things to this one. So the first, first of all is uh, because when we when we send your information, right? And there are a few things, you know, who are the people we send it to and what information part of that, you know, notification. And I think, uh, you know, also, you know, you know, probably also the email address where the, what the email address I will be, you know, receive this email from, from the end user perspective. Uh, so to, I think to add, you know, answer to this one is uh, because for each of the policies, uh, for example, data minimization, data, you know, transfer, and uh, as well as data over exposure, because these are the initiated by the, you know, data owners as well as the, you know, who last modified this data. Uh, so from the, you know, first of all, you know, for, for whom uh, would be the, you know, IW receive this email, we're always looking at the data owner, which is uh, who last modified, or maybe, you know, who, you know, created this file at the beginning. So we are looking at this other signal to send the, you know, information. And the uh, additional one is, uh, we are also, I think, sending from, you know, Microsoft 365, you know, privacy management as the, you know, recipients, uh, as the, you know, the sender to the, to all the recipients. And so I think I just want to add this too. Awesome. Thank you so much.
Now we're, we're very much close to time. Um, so I did wanna thank you all for joining. Um, our next session is Ask Microsoft Anything Secure Data with an Intelligent and People-Centric Approach. Now, before we wrap up, Thank you, Amy, Sanchita, and Min, and thank you all for joining us. Um, we do welcome you to try Priva. Um, our trial is available for 90 days and it enables both solutions. So it's a, it's a good way to get started. Um, and that link is aka.ms uh, forward slash try Priva. Again, thank you all for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.